Very good. Okay, good morning or good afternoon or good evening, everybody. So welcome to another episode in Xericon series of um, safety-related um, webinar topics. Um, this session is hopefully being recorded. It says it's being recorded on the screen, so um, if you want, if one time is not enough and you can't get enough of Xericon webinars, you can always get hold of the recording afterwards. So contact us if you want to take advantage of that. It's going to be very brief. Um, we booked an hour and a half time slot, but we're not going to take that much time. All I want to do is give you a taste of what fault tree analysis is, what you can do with it, and roughly how it works in a typical process safety application. It's a very powerful and adaptable technique, actually. You can apply it to a whole variety of different situations, not just to process safety, um, but that is the context in which I personally have got the most experience of using it. So that's where I'm going to draw most of my examples from, and I'm sure you will find ways of applying it in your own context. So fault tree analysis is basically a frequency calculation method. So as you're probably aware, whenever we're talking about safety, we're interested in trying to measure risk because risk is the thing that we want to control. And risk is basically um, something bad happening to something that we don't want to be harmed, like either people or the environment or assets or some kind of cost-related issue. And harm... Uh, Risk is uh, a measure of how bad the harm can be, basically, and we measure that in terms of how often it can happen, in other words, frequency, and how severe it will be when it happens, so that's severity. Fault tree analysis focuses only on the frequency side of the risk calculation. Um, you might already be aware of another technique that's used to calculate um, frequency of uh, a risk, which is called LOPA, and that's layer of protection analysis. LOPA and fault tree analysis are kind of brothers. Um, one way of saying it is that LOPA is a kind of a light version of fault tree analysis or a sort of a, a more focused version. So or to put it the other way around, fault tree analysis is the kind of full fat version of LOPA. So LOPA is great if you are focused on a single cause or a group of causes that are related in some way um, so that, for example, they all have the same uh, protective layers to prevent the unwanted incident from actually occurring. Fault tree analysis gives you an extra layer of complexity in the analysis in that it allows you to combine a whole lot of different causes which may have different kinds of factors associated with them, such as other layers of protection that you can use. So fault tree analysis is a very nice and powerful step up, as it were, from low path. That's the way I tend to see it. Um, it's, you might then say, well, why do we bother with LOPA? Why not just use fault tree analysis all the time? It is rather complex. It is easy to get a bit lost in the calculations. Um, it's easy to make a mistake because there's a lot of numbers flying around. So LOPA, the, the relative simplicity of LOPA can be an advantage in terms of reducing the opportunity for error and making sure that the team that's performing the analysis can keep on track with the progress and understand what is actually happening and what the final result means. So fault tree analysis can be used in a whole lot of different ways. Um, one of the typical ways that it's used is if you've got a system containing a number of separate components. Um, let's say, for example, you've got a safety PLC or you've got a um, sub-assembly um, of a shutdown valve where you've got the valve itself, you've got its actuator and you've got a, a solenoid valve and maybe a positioner and one or two other components, like a quick exhaust valve. What you may wish to do is to work out a combined failure rate for all of those components put together. And fault tree analysis is a way of doing that. So it's basically it's a way of clubbing together a number of parts into one sub-assembly and saying, give me a number for the expected failure rate of this assembly as a whole. So that's one possible application. Another one, as I've just mentioned, is as a kind of extended version of LOPA. 
for cases where you've got multiple initiating events with different factors associated with them. And we're going to see an example of that a little bit later in the webinar today. And then a third case would be if you've got a, um, an incident that can arise from a very complex set of causalities with lots of ifs and maybes and perhaps and coincidental factors, um, you can also draw a fault tree to try to understand the relationship between all these factors. And that will allow you to discover things like whether you've got single points of failure. Have you got one thing that could go wrong in your system that would basically shut down the whole system? Um, I came across an interesting example of this recently in a, actually quite an old textbook. It's one of those oldies but goodies, you know, a textbook from way back, I think dated 1996, produced by ICME in the UK. Um, which is an introduction to um, risk analysis. And at the back, it's got a whole load of exercises. One of the exercises covers this really complicated scenario that apparently based on a real life scenario where a whole bunch of simultaneous failures occurred. And as a result, the air traffic control system went down at one of the major airports in the UK. And it asks the reader as an exercise to draw a fault tree for this series of events and use that to try to estimate the frequency of such um, a multiple failure event occurring and shutting down the ATC. So fault tree is ideal for that for two reasons really. One is it's numerical. It's a quantitative method so it actually gives you a number at the end of it which then you can use that to feed into further studies. Um, one of the uses of those numbers is to calculate the target SIL and the target risk reduction factor for a safety instrumented function. So that would be if you've got some kind of automated function whose job is to provide risk reduction to prevent an unwanted incident. Um, and if that occurs, then you, if, that, if you've got that in your system, then uh, Fault tree analysis will allow you to work out what's the frequency of that event if the safety function is not implemented. And then you need to know some kind of target frequency of what frequency can I tolerate for that incident. And then the risk reduction factor that the safety function will give you is the ratio of those two values. So fault tree analysis is a very nice way of getting to that target risk reduction factor and the target SIL for the safety function. And another reason why fault tree analysis is a nice technique is because it's graphical, it's visual. You can actually see something that looks like a tree building up in front of you. And so as long as it's well documented and it's clearly labeled, then someone coming along afterwards can understand the reasoning of what was done. It's not obscure. Um, it's possible to trace back the thinking of the team that built up the fault tree in the first place. Okay, so that's what we can use it for. Let's have a look at some examples. So here's a nice simple example to get started. Imagine we're sitting in a meeting room and we're watching a presentation. Um, and there's a projector which is showing us the, the presentation. So a fault tree would allow us to say, well, in what ways could this projector fail to show us the presentation on the screen? And I'm sure you can imagine there are a whole lot of things that could go wrong, some of which might be just human error that we simply don't know how to operate the projector correctly. But um, let's imagine it's some kind of um, hardware failure, system failure. So we might say there's perhaps three different kinds of failure that we might need to be concerned about relating to the projector. Of course, there are many more, but just to make it simple for an example. And these are drawn as base events at the bottom of the fault tree. You can draw a fault tree in any orientation you like. Um, typically, it's drawn from the bottom to the top. So the fundamental basic um, events that start off the chain of events are drawn at the bottom in circles. Alternatively, you can draw it from left to right uh, with base events on the left side and the final outcome, which is that you can't see what the presentation is, uh, on the right side or at the top if you're drawing it from bottom to top. 
doesn't matter. It's just whatever is easiest to follow and whatever fits the, the paper better, basically. So I've got three basic base events in my example here. One is we lose the power. Okay, so unless you're lucky enough to have a projector that has a UPS attached to it, no power means no presentation. That might be good news, however. Let's uh, move swiftly on from that point. Um, another possibility is the projector, of course, has a bulb in it to produce the light. If that fails, that's probably game over as well. Back in the good old days, um, projectors had two bulbs, a spare, but now it seems they don't do that anymore. So if there's one bulb goes, that's the end. That's the uh, end of the presentation for the day. Another possibility is we've got a cable, typically, that connects uh, our computer to the projector, or maybe if you're very ambitious, you might be doing this through Wi-Fi or through the network, um, and that might fail. So then we're stuck. Um, if the video cable fails, well, we might be clever. We might have kept, brought a spare cable with us. And if we're on a VGA connection, then, oh, maybe we realize, hey, we could actually switch over and use HDMI connection instead. Um, so we've got two um, possible ways of getting ourselves out of jail there, as it were, which is uh, to avoid the loss of the display. Um, and if they fail, then that means that the fault tree will continue to propagate upwards towards the loss of display event. So those are the... The lack of spare cable and the not being able to switch to HDMI are not the fundamental root causes of the incident because they are not what caused the incident in the first place. The cause was the cable failed. The cable that we were trying to use failed. Um, so that's why we don't write those uh, events as base events. We write them as some kind of intermediate event in a rectangular box and we combine them with the video cable failure in an AND gate. So this means when we come to actually put numbers in for the frequency or probability of these events occurring, we're going to multiply those numbers together, and we'll see how to do the calculations in a moment or two. So going back to the base events, those three different kinds of base events that we put in our example, power failure, bulb failure, video cable failure, any one of those three would knock out the presentation. So those are combined through an OR logic, and you can see there's an OR gate drawn at the top of the fault tree there. So and that means that power failure causes loss of display, or bulb failure with no spare causes loss of display, or video cable failure with no spare cable and with no possibility of switching to HDMI can cause a loss of display. So we combine those three groups of events or groups of outcomes into uh, an OR gate at the top. So that's at a very simple level, that's how it works. And most of the time, that level of complexity is enough to do what we're trying to do. We, uh, there are a whole lot of other kinds of variants and twists we can use um, and other kinds of event. But most of the time, what you see there in this example, that's enough to get, at least get us started through most simple cases. So we talked a minute ago about plugging in numbers to do the calculation, because that's really the main point of doing a fault tree analysis, is to come out with a frequency of, or a probability of that top level event occurring, which in this case is the loss of display. So what numbers do we need? Well, we need frequencies or probabilities for the base events and for the intermediate events. How do we get such numbers? Well, this is a similar situation to LOPA. Uh, we've got a number of possible sources for getting these frequencies or probabilities, one of which is statistical. So maybe there's a database. If it's some very well-defined event like the malfunction of a transmitter or a sensor device or a valve, for example. There's lots of data from the industry uh, on failure rates for these kinds of devices. There are lots of published databases available. Um, and if we can find appropriate data, then we can just plug that in. Alternatively, we may have data from our own experience. 
So if we are an operating plant, for example, with hundreds of control valves all over the plant, and if we're keeping good enough records of how often these experience various kinds of failure, then we can use that data. The number of failures experienced divided by the number of operating hours of experience uh, um, of experience on the plant. So that gives us a very crude measure for a, a failure rate, failure frequency. Another possibility is to use an analytical method such as FMEA. Um, this basically allows you to build up the um, failure rate expected for a system from its individual components. So we get all the way down to the basic level of, let's say if we're trying to analyze a, a PLC, we break it right down to the level of a microprocessor, a resistor, a capacitor, a connector, a cable, a power supply, really down to absolute basics. And there's plenty of data available for the expected failure rates for these individual components. Uh, FMEA is itself a, a kind of variant on fault tree analysis. So you're almost using a fault tree to feed a fault tree, which is kind of great. Um, gives you a good feeling. And then the third method you can see on the screen, which I already mentioned, you can look up numbers from a suitable database if you can get access to one. For the intermediate events, um, we're more often interested in probabilities of those events occurring rather than frequencies. Now, when we say probabilities, we're typically talking about averaged over the lifetime of the equipment. So let's say if we, we've got an alarm that warns us some base level event has occurred and we need to take action to prevent the fault tree from propagating, what's the probability that that alarm does not work at the moment that it's required. And that we can calculate, um, again, using a sort of fault tree uh, variant, uh, averaged over the lifetime of the equipment. Or again, we can use values from database or from experience. So there's plenty of reasonably well-argued and justifiable data to use to plug in uh, these, these numbers. If you need guidance on getting those sort of values, do feel free to contact us at Xericon. Um, I'm not going to promise you that we will give you a massive database of, of numbers for free, but at least we should be able to point you in the right direction. Right, let's have a look at, in more detail about how the calculations get done. There's a difference here between AND gates and OR gates. For an AND gate, um, we can put frequencies or probabilities into an AND gate, but not more than one frequency at a time. Otherwise, the units don't work out. Because bear in mind, what we're trying to end up with is a frequency. If you multiply a frequency by a frequency, that's time to the minus one times time to the minus one, which gives you time to the minus two. And I don't really know what that means physically. What we need to end up with is either a probability value, which is dimensionless, or a frequency which has got to be time to the minus one in dimension. So we multiply the numbers. However, we need, always need to ask ourselves, are the base events that I'm multiplying together independent of each other? It's a very critical question. We must make sure every time. AND gate inputs must be independent. It's like a mantra that I always kind of recite uh, during the fault tree workshop until everyone is sick of it. But it's very easy to miss. And as soon as you miss that, you make a big mistake with the calculation. Come, the number will come out completely wrong. So you've got to be careful about this one. So let's take an example, a very simple example. Let's say we've got an emergency lighting um, and it's one of those always on emergency lights which will run on the main power when the main power is available. But as soon as the main power fails, it will automatically switch to its battery backup and the light will remain on. So the emergency light fails if the main power is gone and there's something wrong with the battery system. So at that moment, the battery system is unable to power the light. Of course, there are other reasons as well, like maybe the light tube has failed, but we'll just keep it simple and just talk about the power supply system for the moment. So that's an AND gate, but is there a possibility that those two events could be related? Well, what would happen if the power failure that we were talking about was actually some kind of power spike 
which blew up the battery backup system. And I've actually experienced this, so I know this is a possibility. In which case, those two events, the loss of main power and the loss of battery backup power, would actually be not independent. They actually are caused by the same root event. And this is what we refer to as a common cause incident. In such case, you have to split out, you have to split up the power failures into power failures that also cause failure of the battery system, like spikes, or, and, and the other uh, part of the split is power failure events that will not affect the battery backup system. So that's a simple blackout, for example. The ones that uh, relate to a blackout um, that don't cause damage to the battery backup system, those ones are still combined with the failure of the battery backup system independently in an AND gate. The power spike ones, you can't combine them with the, uh, you, you can't use the AND gate there because you've lost the, ind lost the independence. Uh, so they just have to go straight into an OR gate at the top of the fault tree. And this is basically how you handle um, common cause failure events in a um, fault tree. This is a very common situation where you end up having to split up uh, root causes into um, common cause and non-common cause um, base level events. So much for AND gates. What about how do we calculate OR gates? Well, for an OR, we add the frequencies or probabilities of the input events. Um, we can only use probabilities or frequencies. We cannot mix them up in an OR gate. This is because when we're adding physical quantities, they have to have all the same dimensions and the same units, of course. Otherwise, the calculation doesn't have any physical meaning. Um, again, similar to AND, you remember I mentioned that when we're uh, doing the calculation for an AND gate, we have to confirm that all the events are independent. For an OR gate, we have to confirm that all of the individual events are mutually exclusive. Mutually exclusive means they cannot happen at the same time. So an example would be if I throw a dice, the dice can show one, two, three, four, five, or six. It cannot show one and two at the same time, unless it does some weird balancing act on the corner of the dice, which we kind of assume it's not going to do that. So um, those are mutually, the, getting an outcome of one and getting an outcome of two from a single throw of a dice are mutually exclusive event, events. Um, if the events feeding into an OR gate are indeed mutually exclusive, then we can simply add the frequencies or probabilities. If they are not mutually exclusive or we cannot confirm that they are, then we have to do a slightly different calculation using a formula like um, the one you can see in the middle of the screen at the moment. And this is uh, using a method of complements. So this is where we basically work out what's the probability that none of those events occur, which means, looking at the example at the bottom of the screen, there is no sense of failure, and the loop is not in manual mode, and the control valve is not stuck. Ah, now we're back to and logic. So we're going to multiply them, assuming they're independent. Um, yeah, so actually there's a mistake in that formula. I beg your pardon. It says 1 minus sigma, 1 minus pi, but actually it should say 1 minus pi, 1 minus pi, so I apologize for that. You need to multiply together the 1 minus pi's. That's the probability of, pi is the probability of each individual um, input occurring for the OR gate, and you multiply the complements of those together, which is the 1 minus pi, and then you subtract all of that from 1. You take the complement of the overall result. Is the multiplied together 1 minus pi's tells you what's the probability of none of those events occurring. What you want to know is what's the probability that one or more of them occurs. So that's why you take the 1 minus the complement of that. So I apologize for that error. I need to fix that. I'm just going to make a quick note to myself to do that. Hope it's clear.
Okay, common cause. We've already talked about this, but just to make sure that it's clear, let's have a look at another example. Double block and bleed valve. In order to do its job from a safety point of view, a double block and bleed um, is there to isolate the main flow of the fluid, let's say a fuel gas, for example, going to a burner. In order to do that, it needs to successfully close either one of the two main block valves. Um, as long as one of them closes successfully and achieves its tight shut-off requirement, then we're safe. We reach the safe state. Um, if they both fail, then we do not achieve the safe state. And we can ignore the bleed valve from this point of view because the bleed valve is there for a different purpose. It's not there to achieve the isolation of uh, fuel gas from the downstream burner system. Um, so there's two different ways that we can reach this failure condition with both valves failing to close on demand. One of them is that the two valves independently experience a fault. And this is what you see under the AND gate, where it says valve A sticks and valve B sticks. Those would have to be non-common cause types of event. So those are only failure modes where if valve A fails, valve B is, gar is, is guaranteed not to fail for the same reason, or I should say is not guaranteed to fail for the same reason at the same time. It would have to be some independent kind of cause. Um, there is also the possibility that there may be some common cause, that both valve systems, we're talking about a, a, a valve sub-assembly here, so that's valve and uh, actuator um, and solenoid, they could both fail at the same time. Let's say, for example, there's, some, there's been a dirty air supply which has clogged up both of the solenoids at the same time. So they're both on the same air supply, which means that if one of them has failed for that reason, probably the other one will fail as well. So that's a common cause kind of failure mode. And that's why we split that out and put those common cause failure modes on the left side. Um, I don't want to go into too much detail of the calculations here, but typically how this is handled is using um, a factor called beta, which is a fraction of the dangerous failure rate that is um, related to a common cause. So um, if we say that the overall, the total dangerous failure rate of the valve is some value lambda, lambda d, for d for dangerous, then the fraction, then I should say the failure rate of the common cause failures, which is the circle on the left side that says both fail, would be lambda d times beta. And the um, non-common cause failure rate would be lambda d times 1 minus beta. And that would apply to valve A sticks and then the same value to valve B sticks. Okay. Before we go into an example, which we're going to do in a minute, let me just mention a couple of typical traps that catch people out. I've already mentioned the classic one about assuming independence uh, for events that are feeding into an AND gate, um, which must always be checked and justified, and sometimes people miss that. Um, here are some other kinds of uh, <coughs> slightly subtler things that can go wrong that catch people out. One is, in a fault tree, you should not repeat any initiating event. As soon as you have repeated initiating events, your calculation is probably going to go wrong. Um, so you need to try to, if you find when you look at your fault tree that you've got the same root cause appearing in more than one place in the fault tree, you need to try and restructure it in such a way that that event um, is treated as a common cause event. Alternatively, there is a, a, a subtler bit of maths that you can do, which involves a, a technique called cut set analysis, which I'm not going to attempt to go into. But there are ways. Cut set analysis is is the way to handle that. Um, another very subtle pitfall that tends to catch people out is sometimes people want to do the calculation using PFD average as input values. Maybe they get that number from 
um, a data sheet from an equipment manufacturer and they say, oh, great, I'm going to do a PFD, that's a probability of failure on demand, PFD, an, an average value calculation for my sub-assembly. Let's say I've got two redundant solenoids and I know the PFD average of each solenoid because it says that on the data sheet. I'm going to pop it into a, a fault tree and get the answer at the end for the overall PFD average. Unfortunately, if you do that, if you use PFD average as an input value, you'll get the wrong answer in some cases. Um, and the reason for this is very subtly buried in the maths, which I'm not going to attempt to explain. But there's a, an ex excellent uh, couple of books by Bill Goebel, um, which explain this point very nicely. And we will point you to that if you need to know this in more detail. But the way to avoid that pitfall is um, instead of um, using time averaged PFD probabilities as your input, try to use failure rates. Um, or maximum failure probabilities instead of time averaged uh, PFDs as your input values. Anyway, give us a drop us a message if you find that you are uh, facing this potential situation. It's very subtle and it gives you a, an error on the dangerous side. It misleads you into thinking that the failure rate is the overall failure rate is lower than it actually should be by a, quite a considerable margin. Okay, I've got an example to show how fault tree um, can actually work in practice. This is based on a real study that I did for a client a couple of years ago. This was for a client's offshore gas platform. And um, there was a concern that as part of the flare system, um, there's a knockout drum, which actually could be overpressured if all of the relief valves lift at the same time. So there are quite a number of credible overpressure scenarios for this knockout drum. And if it overpressures, it can experience a loss of containment. And that obviously can lead to a potential fire or explosion. And also the gas is sour. So there's a toxic um, incident potential there as well. Which, of course, means downtime for the equipment on the platform and also um, a personnel risk if the platform is occupied at the time, which uh, for this particular client, the platform was indeed occupied uh, a substantial fraction of the time. So this was quite a major concern for them, but they could identify quite a lot of different potential causes for this incident. And um, with a variety of different enabling conditions, that means um, conditions that mean the hazard may or may not be present, and possible conditional modifiers, which are conditions that uh, dictate whether or not the harm will actually occur or not, even if all else fails. So an example of a conditional modifier is the probability of ignition. If you have a gas release, you might be lucky and it might not ignite, although in this case, whether that's actually lucky is open to question because if it's H2S, it's still toxic. Um, so all of those factors are kind of in the melting pot here, and they wanted to try to put all of that together and come up with a realistic number for what is the expected frequency of this overpressure event leading to downtime and potential fatalities. It's too complex for LOPA, so we did a fault tree analysis on it. Um, so in such a case where you've got a lot of possible causes, the first thing to do, of course, is to list out all the causes that you can think of. And sometimes the HAZOP study is a good place to start. So you'll be pulling out your HAZOP report first. Um, some of those cases that you may identify may be what we call low consequence cases. So that is where there's maybe only a very slight overpressure, um, maybe only up to, let's say, 1.2 times the design pressure of the drum, and in which case we might say, well, even if there is a loss of containment, at worst it's going to be only a very minor one, and it's not comparable with the severe overpressure and major loss of containment cases that we're really interested in. So we can set those cases aside because they're relatively small contribution to the overall risk, and we do need to do a few simplifications like this. Another thing we need to consider is we said that there's a potential harm to people and there's a potential harm to assets. Um, the 
um, conditional modifiers may well apply differently to the different risk receptors. So because of that, um, we need to do a separate fault tree analysis um, for each risk receptor that we're interested in, including environmental damage, if that is also a concern. In this case, that was a relatively low issue compared with the uh, personnel and asset impact. Okay, so I'm going to try and do, this is where it's, it, it could all go horribly wrong, but I'm going to try and do a live demonstration here. So I've put um, some of the basic information about this um, incident into a spreadsheet here, which I hope you can see on your screen at the moment. So at the top of the screen we have, what is the basic scenario? It's a knockout drum over pressure leading to a potential failure. We've written down what would be the consequence of that um, overpressure and failure in the reasonable worst case. And then below that, we've listed out what are the um, credible causes that can reasonably lead to that level of consequence. And so we've got these listed out down here. And I've taken six different causes here at the moment. So, and I've grouped these into three groups. The reason I've put them into three groups is because we need to group them according to which IPLs are applicable to each case. Now, IPL is an independent protection layer. So for some of them, we may have time to respond to an alarm. Others, we may not. So only the ones that can, uh, uh, an alarm response is a reasonable layer of protection, maybe because there's enough time and the alarm is independent of the original cause, only those cases will be put into the group uh, for which the alarm is a reasonable layer of protection. So let's have a look at what we've got here. Um, the first group is cases with uh, that relate to some kind of downstream incident where there's a downstream blockage. So we might have um, a pig getting stuck. Okay, let's say we do the pigging, uh, let's say twice a year and maybe the pig gets stuck. Um, I don't know, let's say one time in, what should we say, one time in 20. So maybe that gives us 0 0.1 uh, times per year the pig gets stuck. So these are um, frequencies of these um, base events per year. Another possibility is we have emergency shutdown valve downstream that might get closed. Now with an ESDV, there's a number of reasons why it might be closed. One possibility is ESDV is usually um, the final element for some kind of safety function. So the safety function might experience a trip. It could be a real trip or it could be a spurious trip. So what we should do is go back to our previous LOPA study, which should allow us to estimate what's the frequency of the real expected trip for this um, SIF. In other words, it's expected uh, demand rate. And let's say it's maybe something like 0 0.02. I'm just plucking numbers here just to give us a try to, to do this uh, fault tree calculation. Another possibility is spurious trip. Now, ballpark on average, a, a typical safety function is going to experience a, a spurious trip, let's say about once in 25 years. So let's put that number in there, 0 0.04. That's 1 over 25, I hope. Um, and another possibility is the valve itself may fail. If it's a fail-closed valve, maybe it loses its air supply, maybe the solenoid spring, I don't know. There could be, could be a number of possible causes there that might lead to a, a spurious malfunction of the valve itself. So maybe let's put in a, another little contribution for that one and add those up. Now, we're making a lot of assumptions here. We're packaging a lot of um, values into one we should be writing comments as we go along so that somebody coming along afterwards has got some idea of where did that 0 0.07 number come from and how did we justify it. The next one is there's an MOV downstream. Now MOVs usually would only be closed by an operator action, but maybe the operator uh, presses the wrong button, misunderstands his instructions, makes some mistake during a changeover operation, something like that. So there's a number of possibilities as to why that may happen. Um, so let's say, I mean, typically we say an operator error might be made, let's say one time in a hundred opportunities. So if the operator has to operate that MOV, let's say five times a year, 
that means it's going to make a mistake uh, something like five times in 100 years for that particular incident. And another possibility is there could be some kind of remote blockage at the other end and the receiving station. So we would have to look at what are the credible causes of that, um, how frequently might that occur. Okay, let's just pick some, let's assume we've done that analysis, we pick some number, let's say once in five years that might occur. So then we're going to um, add those numbers up. Let's just add those numbers up. Get Excel to do the hard work for us. So this is now 0 0.242 times per year. So now we've got a base frequency for the downstream blockage series of events, which is looking a bit scary, actually, because that's already, that's about once in every two and a half years. Um, all right, let's have a look at our IPLs now, which I've listed out here, or IPLs and conditional modifiers. Alarms, well, these are total blockage scenarios, or pretty much total blockage. So pressure is going to rise upstream very fast, in which case it's unlikely that we're going to have time to respond to an alarm. So let's say that we take no credit for an alarm. Now what we're writing in these, num in these boxes here is the probability of failure on demand. Uh, so this is the probability that um, the IPL or the conditional modifier is successful in preventing the harm from occurring. So we'll be a little bit conservative there and assume that there's no chance that any alarms that could come would give us enough time to respond in order to prevent the consequence. Occupancy. Well, if there are no people there, then they can't be harmed. So we need some kind of figure for how often that area is occupied at the time that these incidents may occur. Now again, we've got to check, think a little bit about independence here. We may say, oh, on average, the platform is occupied, let's say, 10% of the time. Fine, but what about during a pigging operation? Because we said that one of our basic events is the pig getting stuck. Now, if we're pigging, it might be that the man has to be on the platform during pigging, in which case suddenly the 0 0.1 factor is not valid anymore. But um, taking all of that into account, we need to come up with a probability that the platform is occupied when um, any of those initi initiating event incidents could occur. So let's just pick a number at the moment. Let's say 0 0.2, 20% of the time the platform is occupied. As we said before, this is, uh, that will only protect the personnel. It will not protect the assets, because of course the assets will be damaged whether people are there or not. So that means now we uh, are doing this fault tree analysis specifically for the personnel risk receptor. And we should say that up here at the top. There we go. And we should do a separate fault tree analysis for the other risk receptors. Okay, ignition probability, well, does ignition actually reduce the harm to personnel? Because if it doesn't burn, it's toxic. If it does burn, then you've got a fire or explosion. So I would say you're probably dead either way, unfortunately, whether it ignites or not. You might be lucky, maybe if it doesn't burn, then you might be downwind, uh, upwind of the release. So, okay, maybe we could take some credit for that. Um, I don't know. I think in this case, we're probably better off taking no credit for the ignition. Another uh, IPL is that there might be a separate trip which independently shuts off the wellheads when high pressure is detected. And in this case, there, there, is, there is such a function, and it's a SIL2 rated function, <clears throat> which means worst case, if it achieves its SIL2 target, it will work at least 99% um, of the time, because that's the definition of what we mean by SIL2. So that means the most conservative credit we can take for that is 0 0.01. If we have done a SIL verification study and we know what the actual performance of that uh, safety function is, the expected performance as predicted by SIL verification, we can plug that number in there. So it may tell us that the... Um, PFD average for this safety function is, let's say, 0 0.0076. Maybe that number is what comes out of the SIL study. In which case, fine, we can take that credit. 
if we feel confident that that number is, is valid and justifiable. Okay, um, let's have a look at the remaining cases. So we've dealt with most of it so far, or maybe before we move on. Um, to combine the initiating event frequencies with the IPLs, we need to put them together into an AND gate. What we're saying here is, if the initiating events occur, any one of them, and the alarms fail, and people are there in the danger zone, and uh, ignition occurs, and the PAHH function doesn't work, then the harm can occur. So we combine all of those in an AND manner, which means multiply. So let's multiply them together, like so. There we go, so we get 0 0.0006 something. Now you'll see a lot of decimal places there, 6384, but bear in mind that all of our, practically all of our initiating event numbers have been to only one significant figure. If we put inputs with only one significant figure, we can only take one significant figure as our output. So the 0 0.6384 it's not really reasonable to, to claim all of that precision. When it comes to writing the report, I would say the answer is 0 0.0006. And bear in mind, this is a frequency per year. So that is uh, 6e minus 4, or roughly 6 times in 10,000 years. Now, that might be somewhere approaching the tolerable frequency. I would guess the tolerable frequency for this incident is probably going to be somewhere around 1 time in 10,000 years. And now we're at six times per 10,000 years. So looks like we probably do need some additional risk reduction from a separate safety function. Anyway, let's just finish off the rest of the calculation. Um, another possible cause is that we've got an upset with a blowdown valve on the platform. Okay, blowdown valve, it's a fail open valve, or it could be opened by mistake. So let's say we've got a probability or a frequency of, let's say, 0 0.02 of that. A year. Now, blowdown valve is smaller relatively than the other valves, so the pressure buildup, if this occurs, would be slower. So this time we probably have got time to respond to some alarms, like blowdown valve discrepancy alarm or high pressure alarm. Typical credit we would take for alarms when they're reasonable as a layer of protection is a probability of failure on demand of 0.1. And that's taking into account the probability that the alarm itself works, which means the sensor works and the DCS works and the sounder works, and the probability the operator sees the alarm, he understands it, he interprets it correctly, he makes the correct decision about what action to take, he takes that action in a timely manner, and his action is successful. Packaging all of that together, that's a lot of ands if you think about it, but when you package all of those together, a reasonable overall number is somewhere in the region of 0 0.1. That also assumes, by the way, that you have a, um, a trustworthy alarm system, which generally means that you've done your alarm rationalization um, and you have a well-managed alarm system in compliance with the alarm management standard, which is IEC 62682. Occupancy. Um, should be the same situation as before. If it does rupture, um, then people may be harmed, but if they're not there, then they won't be harmed. Ignition probability, well, again, maybe if it's because the pressure is going to build much more slowly, so that means the potential release is going to be smaller, so maybe there's less chance of it igniting. However, again, we've still got the issue that it's toxic, even if it doesn't ignite, so maybe we don't take credit for that. And we've still got our PAHH separate safety function that we can take credit for. Okay, let's multiply the numbers together. There we go. So that's a much smaller contribution. Now, there's so many zeros there, I can't read it. But comparing this value, 6e, 3e minus 6, I think it is, with this number, 6e minus 5, it's clearly a factor of 20 times less. So we probably don't need to worry about that particular case too much. Um, then we've got a third case. I think time is getting on, so maybe I won't uh, dwell on this in too much detail because I think we've got the general idea of how this works. But there's a possibility that hydrate formation may occur in the export pipeline. Um, if anyone's not familiar with this, 
Um, under certain conditions, if you've got natural gas in the presence of water, it's possible for them to form a, a kind of a, a chemical complex, which is solid, and that can obstruct pipelines and block up valves and relief valves and so forth. Um, it is possible to prevent that by adding some kind of additive. Typically, it's methanol. And there are other kinds of additive you can use as well. A hydrate formation, if, it, if we're talking about blocking an export pipeline, this will be an enormous pipeline, maybe 60 inches or 72 inches. So it's not going to instantly plug with, with hydrates. It's going to gradually build up over time, maybe over a matter of days or, or weeks. So it's the kind of thing that we will notice happening. And there are various ways that we could notice it, uh, one of which is through um, lab analysis. The export gas, they may see that there's hydrates or potential for hydrates to be formed in there and there's no additive present in, in the gas. So that may be noted. So let's say there's a 90% that that is successful, a 10% chance that it misses um, the incident occurring. Um, it might well be that hydrates only form when the amb ambient temperature is low enough, and so that might be only during winter time. So let's say it's only maybe for a quarter of the year that the ambient temperature is low enough. Depends on the specific location. Another possibility is that as the hydrate starts to build up, um, of course the hydrate is gradually consuming some fraction of the gas because the hydrate is composed of gas and water. So that means that the, there must be a flow imbalance between the gas going into the pipe and the gas coming out of the pipe. And that imbalance may well certainly should be noticed because this is your saleable product that's disappearing. So hopefully your FQIs will show you that. And there's a possibility as well that you might even realize directly that the hydrate addition is not working because you might get an alarm from the chemical dosing package that's supposed to add it. So let's see where that, oops, let me just try that again. Let's see where that puts us. That gives us another pretty small contribution. Um, this one is um, 2e minus 5. Yeah, compared with up here where we had 6e minus 4. So actually, I think this is 3e minus 6, isn't it? So clearly, we're, we're very much dominated by the first group of causes. So if we felt that we were concerned about this overall frequency, then what we need to do at the end, by the way, is to add these three numbers up. Um, I won't do that at the moment just to save time. But in your fault tree, the last thing you will do is you will group these three groups of causes together in an OR gate. And we're assuming that these are, well, we don't have to assume they're mutually exclusive, um, but because they are all low frequency events, the chances of any two of two or more of them happening simultaneously is extremely low. Um, you can do the non-mutually exclusive calculation, you'll get almost exactly the same result. So it's, uh, it's, it's hardly worth the effort, but you can do it anyway. And I think you can see once we add up these three numbers, um, as in this one, and this one, and this one, these are all frequencies. Bear in mind that we're going to get a number that's almost the same as this. It's going to be something like 6e minus 4 per year. And that will be the final outcome, the frequency of the overpressure event. Sorry, I should say the frequency of fatalities occurring from the overpressure event because we took it all the way up to the final outcome by including the occupancy credit there as well. So there we go, that was a practical, hopefully useful and easy to follow demonstration um, of how to do the fault tree in practice. So um, I'm just about done here. Just mention a few little details about how fault tree would be done in practice. It's normally done in some kind of workshop. It's certainly better not done as one individual just sitting at his or her own desk trying to work this out because there's so many assumptions and so many bits of knowledge and information that need to be plugged in. It's unlikely that one person would have all of that information. So it's better done in a multidisciplinary workshop, just like you would do with LOPA or with HAZOP. 
it takes time. It is surprisingly time consuming. That case that you just saw that we worked on the screen, that took us two days of workshop time to get to that conclusion. Now I've left a lot, a lot out to simplify it for our demonstration here, but um, yes, it's time consuming. You can really only expect best case to do maybe four or five cases per day if you've got a lot of cases to work through. Much more time consuming than LOPA. Um, you need some kind of software to record the proceedings. Um, there is dedicated fault tree software available. I have to admit I've not used it personally, so I can't recommend any specific package. We are working on releasing a package uh, by Xericon within the coming few months. So if you're interested, let us know, drop us an email and we'll let you know when it's available to try out. In the meantime, um, as you can see, I just did it in Excel. And as long as you're careful with the numbers, you can do it and it, it works out okay. Um, another thing to be careful about is there's a real strong tendency for groupthink to occur in fault tree workshops because what everybody sees on the screen is this mass of numbers and assumptions and calculations flying here, there and everywhere. It's very difficult to follow all of the arguments and all of the points that have been made as you go along. So every so often you should stop, you should stand back and you should say, okay, let's regroup. What decisions have we made so far? What assumptions have we made? Let's sure, make sure that everything we've written down in the worksheet, we all agree with it. And just pause, maybe once an hour, do that, reassess, and then continue. As I've found so many times when doing fault tree analysis, you get back to the office afterwards, you do a review of the worksheet, and you find, hey, that doesn't make sense. Why did we say that? How did we justify that uh, value in there? And you'll find that in the all of the kind of confusion of the workshop environment, some important points have got missed out or uh, confused or mixed up with each other. So all the calculations need to be checked by hand. Uh, actually, for that reason, I generally don't actually get Excel to do the calculations for me. I do them by hand because that at least forces me to look at the numbers one by one and make sure that I'm, I'm calculating what I really think I'm calculating. And the final point I want to make, this is super important, every single assumption and every single value you, you uh, choose and every justification for the value and the source of data that you use must be documented. So if you, for example, you're using a HAZOP study or using a database, write down the exact reference. Don't just say derived from HAZOP study. Say derived from HAZOP study, node one, deviation two, calls three, consequence four. Um, so that somebody else can go back and see where you got that information from and why you made that decision. Not only is this good practice just for its own sake and for also for review purposes, but this also adds value to the fault tree analysis in the future because quite often later on somebody may need to go back and review what you did in the context of a management of change study. And if they can't see the justifications for your numbers, there's no way where, that they can as assess the impact of the proposed change on the fault tree analysis that might have been done a number of years earlier. And if that happens, then maybe they have to do it all over again. So your effort is, is at least partly wasted in such case. We are done here. Thank you very much for your attention. Um, questions are welcome. If you have a question that you'd like to ask, please go ahead and uh, unmute your mic and ask the question. Alternatively, do feel free to email us afterwards. The email address is on the screen at the moment. Um, we will also send you a questionnaire asking for your thoughts on uh, how we did today, whether this was useful, and what future topics you might be interested in for our webinar series. Because you, you may not be aware that um, this is already, I forget exactly how many webinars we've done before, but at least four or five webinars have come before this, and we're hoping to continue the series, but we want it to be useful to you in whatever context you uh, are looking for some insights and introduction to some topics you might not have experienced before. So do let us know uh, what other topics you'd be interested in.